The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody. You're all very welcome to this, we this we webinar. This is a very important milestone for the sector because it's a, a virtual launch of the updated uh, low carbon, the IEA Low Carbon Technology Roadmap, sponsored by the CSA. Just moving on to the next slide, the, inter the, 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 present the presentation team for the seminar. Uh, on the next slide, please. Uh, I, I just, I, my name's Mark Lowry. I'm the CSI Chair Liaison Delegate. I work for CRH. With me from the IEA are C Simone Landolina and Araceli Fernandez. Also Manuela Oyan from Heidelberg Cement, member of the CSI, and the, also the Managing Director of the CSI, Philippe Fonta. Next slide, please. The CSI, the Cement Sustainability Initiative, uh, is a, was an initiative set up by the sector. In fact, the cement sector was the first sector to recognize the need uh, and the absolute necessity of working collaboratively to address the challenges of climate change. The CSI consists of 24 member companies, of which nine are core members and 15 are participating members, and it accounts for approximately one third of global cement production. The CSI is a project within the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the WBCSD, in fact, it's the largest project within the WBCSD. The WBCSD is the world's leading sustainable business organization. It's CEO-led and comprises of almost 200 forward-thinking businesses working together with the mission to accelerate the transition to a sustainable world by making more sustainable business more successful. The next slide. By the year 2050, there will be 9.8 billion people on this planet. 60% of the buildings that will be required to house those people, to uh, give them places to work, to facilities to educate them, hospitals to look after them, uh, uh, water treatment works to give them clean water, etc., to provide a transportation network that will get them from A to B, 60% of those have, have yet to be built. So it is clear that concrete, which is already the world's largest man-made product, is going to, uh, the demand for that is going to continue to increase dramatically. And of course, in tandem with that, the absolute necessity that we continue to drive down CO2 emissions. CSI companies have long been taking action in this area. 18 of them have signed up to the Cement Low Carbon Transfer Part Partnership Initiative through which they commit to reducing their CO2 by between 20 and 25% by the year 2030 versus business as usual. So the sector clearly recognizes the need to work collaboratively, and it also recognizes this collaboration needs to extend beyond the sector to the broader construction value chain, and indeed to the whole built environment value chain to ensure that we deliver on the absolute necessity to create a carbon neutral built environment. And with that now, I will hand you over to Simone. So good morning, everybody, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Simone Landolina. I lead the International Partnerships and Initiatives team at the International Energy Agency, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar today. The International Energy Agency is an autonomous organization within the OECD framework that works to ensure reliable, affordable, and clean energy for its 30 member countries and beyond. We are based in Paris, and the IA's first mission was promoting the energy security of its member countries. It was founded after the 1974 oil crisis to help countries coordinate a collective response to major disruptions in oil supply through the release of emergency oil stocks to the market. So while energy security continues to be a key aspect of our work, the IA has evolved and is now at the heart of global energy dialogue and a transition to a clean energy future, thanks to its authoritative statistics, analysis, and policy recommendations. The IA's mission today revolves around three further core priorities in addition to energy security. Economic development, supporting free markets to foster economic growth and eliminate energy poverty. Environmental awareness, 
analyzing policy options to offset the impact of energy production and use on the environment, especially for tackling climate change and air pollution. An engagement worldwide, working closely with partner countries, especially major emerging economies, to find solutions to shared energy and environmental concerns. So this map provides a brief overview of the global network of IA collaborations, including uh, IA member countries, uh, who are all part of the OECD, so 30 member countries, as I mentioned, in the Asia Pacific, America, and Europe, uh, as well as a, a range of partner countries. In fact, having observed a shift in energy consumptions from IA member countries to emerging economies, since 2015, through the Association Initiative, the IA has strengthened relations with the major emerging economies, such as Brazil, China, Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore, Morocco, and India. Together with IA member countries, today 27 IA non-member countries that are shown in blue in this map, participate in the technology collaboration programs. TCPs represent a network of over 6,000 experts worldwide from over 300 entities, including governments, private sector, and research centers. And more than a dozen additional countries are discussing participation. Now, with these partners, the IA is working to support the global clean energy transition as the leading provider of data analysis and solutions, notably through our clean energy transition program. In fact, signs of a global energy transition keep on coming. Renewable supply alpha global and its leashes demand growth in 2016, and nuclear net capacity reached the highest level since 1993. Global energy intensity improved, while efforts for fossil fuel subsidy reform are spreading. So clean energy technologies are progressing, but few on track. And lack of progress on some puts even more pressure on others. So limiting the global temperature rise to 2 degrees will require an energy transition of exceptional scope, depth, and speed. And it is against this background that since 2009, the IA has produced a range of over 30 technology roadmaps, covering more than 20 of the key technologies for energy sector decarbonization, including industrial processes. The program has been a, a considerable success, and it has provided recognized guidance to the public and private sector, in part due to its collaborative nature, evidence-based recommendations on the priorities and steps needed to accelerate technology innovation and deployment, and emphasis on broad stakeholder engagement. So in 2016, we started a new cycle roadmap that was reendorsed by the G7 and that seeks to further raise the ambition of the program, showing policymakers, investors, and entrepreneurs who are navigating an increasingly diverse and regionally specific energy landscape, how they can jointly act to transform our global energy system. Um, so the IA has been collaborating with the cement industry uh, for for a long while, for more than a decade, in fact. And we would like to thank CSI for their continued collaboration, which has been an invaluable part of our industry analysis. The first global cement roadmap uh, of the IA was our uh, first joint publication with CSI, and also among the IA's first roadmap released in 2009. This was followed by our first national cement roadmap for India in 2013. Uh, which was developed in close collaboration with CSI's Indian members and included an implementation phase supported by the IFC. I should say that we are also providing input and support for a second national roadmap for Brazil. And we are pleased to be working again together on the latest global cement roadmap. And I would like to turn over to Araceli to present the details from this report. Thank you very much, Simone. Just to extend a welcome to everyone on the line. And so moving more specifically to the cement technology roadmap process, um, the main objective of this project is really to develop an implementable long-term sustainable vision for the cement sector. And I mean, this time we follow a very similar process as we did for the initial edition in 2009. Uh, there are different types of inputs that are informing this exercise. First of all, technology papers. So compiling information on what are the uh, improvement potentials and cost implications of different technology options to reduce the CO2 footprint of cement production. Um, <clears throat> we've been also uh, compiling information in terms of energy and CO2 emissions performance related to, again, uh, the manufacturing of cement, relying quite uh, importantly on the uh, getting the numbers right database, which is managed by the Cement Sustainable Initiative, uh, compiling data that is externally verified, 
uh, from cement producers, but also other uh, local sources for uh, energy performance uh, data. Um, all that information then is in, uh, fed into our analytical and modeling tools uh, that we use to build our long-term uh, list code scenarios to understand what the role of the different emission reduction opportunities would be in uh, sustainable uh, long-term scenarios uh, from a list cost perspective. And then, of course, all that information, all that work is released for external review through stakeholders uh, through a wide network of uh, different parties involved, including authorities, academia, industrial associations, to make sure that we can integrate uh, the knowledge and expertise out there. So this time, Safe mentioned, we follow a very similar process. Uh, the first step uh, was to really um, look into the technology papers that were developed by the uh, European Cement Research Academy, commissioned by uh, CSI. Um, again, very similarly in 2009, that was the process also followed. And this was a quite comprehensive compilation of papers describing different technology options and strategies to improve uh, uh, the CO2 footprint or reduce also uh, energy consumption in cement production. At the time in 2009, 33 different technology papers were produced. And for this uh, round, uh, 52 technology papers have been produced. So there's been quite a significant expansion and improvement of the uh, coverage in that respect. And those papers were published in March uh, last year and are available in this, I mean, well, this uh, link that you can see in the, in the slide. There are certain areas that were expanded, as I've mentioned, um, namely uh, in the slide you can see a few of them, uh, for instance, when it comes to waste heat recovery technologies, that assessment was refined. Also, um, technologies related to the treatment or treatment of fuels, especially alternative fuels, but also energy efficiency and management, as well as optimized grinding technologies, and also uh, other cement constituents, uh, that we're exploring more detail as options for a further reduction of the clinker to cement ratio, as well as alternative binding materials. And there was also uh, specific additions related to carbon capture and use uh, to understand also what opportunities would be there from uh, the cement uh, industry perspective. Each of those papers include information on describing these technologies, but also uh, what the impact would be in terms of energy um, energy uh, intensity uh, uh, implications, so energy savings, or an impact on an increased energy requirement in some cases, as well as uh, what the resulting CO2 uh, implications would be, and also information related to uh, incurred costs. So just going in more detail about setting the context of the analysis of the roadmap, um, the first thing we wanted to do is to set what the current context of the cement industry is. And for this, we want to touch into three main specific aspects. The first one is about energy consumption. So globally, the cement industry is the third industrial energy user uh, after chemicals and petrochemicals and iron steel. And in terms of fossil fuels consumption, it's quite reliant on uh, fossil fuel use. And it represents the second industrial coal, uh, coal use, as you can see here. Coal consumption represents around 60% globally of final energy uh, demand in the sector. Um, in terms of CO2 emissions, the cement sector has quite a specific characteristic where we have to distinguish between energy-related and uh, process-related uh, CO2 emissions. So during the production of cement, there is a step uh, in which clinker is produced from limestone uh, through um, different chemical reactions in which uh, process CO2 emissions are uh, generated. And those represent, as you can see here, about two thirds of the total uh, direct CO2 emissions that are generated in the, in the process. And this is quite a, a specific challenge of the industry that is explored also in the, in the roadmap, uh, how this could be overcome. The third component we wanted to mention about uh, setting the specific characteristics of cement production uh, is related to um, what is behind the cement uh, composition. So here you can see an estimated average cement composition globally. Uh, one of the factors to highlight is that uh, clinker, which is shown as the light green uh, section, uh, is the main precursor of cement and the, uh, basically the component that is related to uh, most of the thermal energy uh, use in the, uh, throughout the production process. The industry has been looking at um, other constituents for cement uh, to try to lower the um, clinker to cement ratio. 
and it's been relying on industrial byproducts through blended cements such as um, fly ash and also blast furnace uh, slack that are produced either in coal power plants or also in the iron steel uh, manufacturing process, as you can see here in purple and uh, yellow. This is one of the challenges as well that we've been discussing in more detail through the presentation and in the roadmap as some of these uh, byproducts will be more limited in the future, in a, especially in a two degrees context or in a, let's say, a low carbon context where those activities, especially power, uh, coal power generation and iron steel sector would be shifting away from established uh, process routes and using more sustainable um, technologies to produce those, those services. This is one of the challenges we'll be discussing as well. Um, more on the forward looking uh, for the analysis of the roadmap, we've developed uh, um, two sets of, let's say, cement, uh, cement demand variants. One called low variability and high variability that you can see in the screen. This is showing the, the global cement production. And you can see uh, a depict, depicted uh, regional contribution for cement production uh, covering the whole world for the low variability case. So again, with the idea of trying to uh, manage the uncertainty uh, of uh, projecting uh, cement demand in the future. Um, as has been mentioned by Mark, I mean, we expect strong growth in population and also urbanization, urbanization trends that are driving upwards the demand for cement to develop the infrastructure that was required to uh, basically ensure um, a well-being uh, society. And um, in that respect, you can see in the slide that the global cement production uh, in our analysis is expected to increase between 12 to 23 percent. Uh, from 2014 to 2050 uh, at the global level. So in terms of regional breakdowns, you can see here that, I mean, towards the long term, we are expecting a, a lower or slower than activity in the cement sector in China, uh, which is shown in gray at the bottom of the, of the chart, uh, which uh, in any case uh, is compensated by strong growth that is seen in other Asian countries, uh, namely India, which makes that the whole uh, Asia region uh, sells uh, relatively similar in terms of overall cement production over time, but still loses 10% of its global contribution to the total, uh, to the global uh, production uh, level. Um, of course, you see also other regions that are uh, experiencing growth, especially Africa and Latin America as well. Um, so for the roadmap, we've looked at different uh, sets of strategies in terms of uh, mitigating or reducing CO2 emissions from cement production, and we grouped them in four categories. Uh, energy efficiency, switching to alternative fuels, reducing clinker to cement ratio, and innovative technologies. And of course, all of them are interrelated in the sense that they cannot be explored independently, if you implement one of them, you may impact another one. For instance, if you switch to alternative fuels, for instance, biomass or, or certain waste, then uh, typically they have lower calorific content, which means that you may require a, a greater uh, a thermal energy in the, in the kiln. So this would impact, again, energy efficiency. And we've looked at those interrelations as well uh, in, the, in the analysis. Um, we explore two main scenarios uh, in this uh, roadmap. One is the baseline scenario that is called the reference technology scenario. And basically it considers energy consumption trends um, being continued as well as commitments by countries to limit CO2 emissions and improve energy efficiency, including NDCs pledged under the Paris Agreement. And this is what you can see on the top as the dotted black line. And then we've also considered a low carbon context uh, as exploratory scenario for the uh, vision of the roadmap which is the two degree scenario that you can see uh, as the green dotted line at the uh, bottom of the wedge graph. And this scenario is basically um, setting out an energy system pathway to limit the average uh, global uh, temperature increase to two degrees in the long term. So in this graph, you can see also what the relative contribution of these four uh, families of strategies in, the, in terms of the reductions of CO2 emissions for cement production on the uh, direct CO2 emissions, more specifically in this case. So you can see that specifically uh, reduction of clinker to cement ratio and innovative technologies, including carbon capture, uh, are the key uh, leaders, let's say, in, the, in terms of uh, the impact on CO2 emission reduction. 
Cumulatively, the reductions in emissions between the uh, RTS and the two degree scenario represent around almost eight gigatons of CO2, which are uh, almost 90% of today's direct global industrial CO2 emissions um, in, the, in the industrial sector. So going in more detail into some of those families of strategies, the first one as I was mentioned was energy efficiency. Um, we've been exploring also uh, what the role of uh, technologies and operating strategies could be to improve the energy footprint of cement production. Here you can see um, that by 2050, uh, both on um, uh, thermal energy intensity of clinker and electricity intensity of cement, which are the two graphs displayed, um, the global average reaches about the best performing level around 2050 on those two uh, parameters, which is the uh, dark green uh, kind of bar that you can see in the screen. These improvements are achieved by uh, basically uh, deploying faster, accelerating deployment and uh, the impact of best um, available technologies or state-of-the-art technologies. If we think about, for instance, dry kilns uh, with precal signers and multi-stage cyclone preheaters, but also other efficiency, energy efficiency uh, strategies as increasing vulnerability of, of raw materials, for instance. On the electricity side, um, again, accelerating the deployment um, and pushing deployment of state-of-the-art technologies like, such as high-pressure grinding roll, uh, rolls or vertical roller mills um, as well, and all the um, optimized grinding technologies that um, the uh, ECRA papers did a quite a thorough uh, analysis on. One of the aspects to highlight on this slide is that, as I mentioned before, the implementation of other carbon emission mitigation levers uh, tend to have an impact in, um, in energy efficiency in this case, and this is what we were trying to display here. For instance, um, as I've mentioned, the uptake of alternative uh, fuels could have an upward effect in terms of energy consumption that you can see in the light green uh, portion of the bars uh, that is growing as farther alternative fuels are, uh, or the uptake of alternative fuels get further deployed in terms of the thermal mix of cement production. Similarly, for instance, if you penetrate, uh, once penetrate uh, carbon capture technologies, they need electricity and thermal energy to be operated that you can see in the light blue. And also um, a strategy that we've been analyzing for uh, supporting the reduction of the clinker to cement ratio, which is the use of uh, calcium clay as an alternative cement constituent, uh, requires some thermal energy as well as electricity to basically activate uh, clays uh, for that purpose. So these are the effects that we are discussing before that will be uh, also analyzed in the, in the roadmap. In terms of the uh, role of alternative fuels, um, as well uh, as you can see here, uh, currently, as we've mentioned in the previous slides, uh, the role of alternative fuels in the global thermal energy mix of cement production is um, a bit of, um, slightly above 5% of the thermal energy uh, consumption. Um, and this is um, further increased in the two degrees context, both in the low variability case and high variability cases you can see here, um, so that we are moving from a contribution of fossil fuels around 94% uh, in the base year uh, towards around 70% um, in 2050 in the uh, two degree scenario at the global level. And this is achieved by uh, a greater use of biomass type of fuels and also waste, uh, such as, for instance, discarded tires, waste stalls, or industrial wastes, as well as uh, some biomass uh, uh, materials, as is mentioned, like waste wood or, or sawdust that uh, could be integrated in the operations of the uh, cement kiln. So with that, I'm going to pass the, the floor uh, to Manuela Ojan from Halderberg Cement, as she is going to be uh, continuing the uh, description and the presentation of the technical details of the cement roadmap analysis. The floor is yours, Manuela. Yes, thank you, Araceli. So uh, I will proceed with the next slide showing one of the other levels that will provide the main contribution on the long term on CO2 reduction, and that is indeed the reduction of clinker content in cement. Uh, we have found that in 2014, 
as an average, the clinker content in cement was 65%. And to reach, to comply with the two degree scenario at uh, least cost, this uh, share is supposed to decrease to 60% 60, 60 at global level, with of course some regional differences. Um, uh, indeed, clinker can be partially replaced with other cement constituents such as gypsum, natural porcelana, uh, limestone, and industrial byproducts. Already today, you can see from the pies, uh, a huge contribution comes from industrial products with 13% from blast furnace lag and 6% from fly ashes. But unfortunately, this contribution is expected to decrease over the years due to reduce availability of materials. Since these are industrial byproducts, probably iron and steel industries will move towards scrap based electric arc furnaces and so reduce the supply of slag, as well as power production will use less and less coal in the future. So the intent is to replace um, these materials with other materials and uh, other uh, cement uh, components and uh, limestone then can play a greater uh, uh, higher share as today moving from eight percent to 18 percent indeed limestone is already used widely as a filler but we also have a new entry that is uh, calcine clay that will uh, reach eight percent calcine clay indeed is already used in some uh, um, in some regions in the world, for example, uh, Brazil, and uh, some limits in terms of application, but these limits are being overcome uh, using uh, more and more calcium clay together with, in combination with limestone. This is also one of the reasons for the increase of contribution of uh, limestone to the total composition in 2050. Um, about calcine clay, indeed, it needs it's a it needs thermal treatment and it is in fact the results of drying uh, crushing and calcination of clay and we have seen before this will bring a penalty in terms of uh, um, energy consumption um, the result of this change of uh, of composition of cement we said will uh, deliver 37 percent of cumulative sa savings overall um, why uh, we forecast this change of composition of cement? Uh, to do this kind of assessment based on um, least cost, we use also as reference the technology papers produced by ECRA. So we can see in the next slide that ECRA, they did an in-depth assessment. Can you, uh, next slide, please. Hello. Yes, um, uh, ECRA in the, techno in the new technology papers issued in 2017, they uh, explored low carbon solution to change the cement composition. And for each of them, they went into that with, a, uh, with an assessment in terms of potential impact, necessary material input, and main influencing parameters. Solutions for which uh, technology papers are available are uh, high performance cement, for example, ultra high performance concrete, uh, and the intent here is to reduce the volume of concrete per square meter of application. Um, very high, very low lime saturation factors, and also a series of reduction of clinker content using alternative materials like, as we have seen before, glamour blood furnace like fly ash, natural porcelana, other materials, for example, including silica fumes, industrial or agricultural uh, ashes, and as said before, calcine clay. If we look into more detail as calcine clay, there are also some quantitative um, details about the impact of use of calcined clay in terms of material inputs that can be used up to zero uh, up to zero 35 tons of calcined clay per ton of cement uh, guaranteeing the same performance of portland cement uh, as said due to the drying process and thermal treatment of raw clay 
there is an increase in use of thermal energy, but at the same time, there is a reduction of electric energy usage linked with the grindability of the material. Overall, the impact on direct and indirect CO2 emission is positive, as it is quantified, as you, see, as you can see, in 30 kilograms of CO2 per ton of cement decrease and 2.5 kilograms of CO2 in terms of indirect CO2 emission. However, uh, we need to pay attention to which are the main influencing parameters for use of calcined clay. It's mainly quality, availability and the price, including uh, price linked and cost linked with the logistics of the material, of the transport of the material, cost for treatment and, cal and cancellation, and the overall composition of the cement itself. So this is one of the levers we, we are already exploring in the, in the actual roadmap. Uh, next one. Another opportunity that has been assessed is the use of alternative binder material to offer further CO2 reduction potential. Uh, these alternative binding materials, a few of them are still are already in, at commercial level. This is the, the um, case of Bilai cement and CSA, CSA clinker. Others are still at demonstration and pilot phase, and also there are other also in R&D phase. So uh, indeed, these uh, uh, alternative cement rely on different uh, raw mixes and they are an opportunity, but in terms of innovative technology. This is mainly because of limitations they have. Uh, the limitations are mainly linked to aspects such as raw material availability and operational cost. Just to give you an example, this is a case of uh, MOM clinker. You can see from the graph with this material, theoretically, uh, we can displace 100% of CO2 emissions, but uh, this material that is uh, a cement based on magnesium oxide derived from magnesium silicate um, has some issues related to the high energy demand for transformation of the magnesium silicate to magnesium oxide. So it's not currently viable as a product. Uh, in this case, the uh, almost full offsetting of CO2 emission is due to the fact that the material could absorb CO2 during the curing phase. But here we are still at an R&D stage. Another limitation could be that, that um, there is not uh, yet a market for the product or the product has a limited applicability and there are no uh, standards and norms um, allowing for the use of the material. This is, for example, the, ca the case of um, uh, BCSA clinker, that is B-Light CSA clinker, and uh, that is yet not accepted in norms and is not commercially produced accordingly. The same is the case of CACS, that is a cement based on carbonation of calcium silicate and it also can sequester CO2 at the curing phase. But also this product uh, for, for the time being is just a limited application so it can only be used in precast. So the market currently is still rather limited. So what we can say is that in any case further research and development is needed before these uh, uh, products can be uh, included in the technology-based evaluation such as we have in our roadmap. So it's a little bit premature for us to include it in the roadmap. That's why they have been included in uh, uh, the, the field of innovative technologies. The other main innovative technology that is shown in the roadmap, and this is the next slide, is carbon capture and uh, carbon capture at the cement kin stack. It's an, an innovative technology, and uh, it's related to the fact that after being generated in the kin, the CO2 can be captured or purified from kiln fuel gases when combustion happens with oxy fuel in oxy fuel conditions. 
According to the IEA modeling, uh, the oxyfuel technology will be the first one in terms of volume capture to appear on the market. As you can see from the graph, um, starting from 2025, the full oxyfuel technology will start delivering some results in terms of capture ton of uh, million tons of CO2 per year, and it will keep steadily increasing over uh, the years. Indeed, as far as CO2 limitations become stricter, also more expensive mitigation options will become necessary. And then you see that starting from 2035, 2040, also the partial oxy, uh, the post combustion technology will start delivering uh, uh, results. Indeed, overall expectations are that in 2050, 2000, uh, the 25-29. Uh, the, a range between 25 and 29 percent of generated CO2 emissions will be captured. Um, also, uh, ECRA technology papers uh, uh, provide a deep dive into the different types of carbon capture technologies. Just to give an example, this is the te uh, technology on oxyfuel. Um, so in the technology paper, the potential impact in terms of electricity uh, use is shown. It's indeed an increase in the case of oxyfuel uh, of use of electricity. This is um, due to the need uh, to produce the oxygen. And uh, overall, there is a net uh, benefit in terms of direct CO2 emission. So the decrease of uh, a CO2 emission per ton of clinker can even reach the 100% of CO2. Um, as said, the material input needed for this technology is the production of oxygen from a separation unit. Uh, the influencing parameters for this type of, this type of technology that needs, by the way, a re-engineering, a full re-engineering of the cement plant is uh, uh, the influencing parameter is the level that can be reached in terms of air tightness of the keel, so to avoid air inleaks. Uh, the difficulties and the cost of CO2 purification and of CO2 concentration. Overall, if we, according to ECRA, an estimation of cost today foresees an investment of uh, more than 100 million euro per plant and associated with an operational cost increase between 9 and 40 euro per ton of cement. And overall, this will impact on the uh, clinker production cost um, as uh, such as to have 45 euro per ton of CO2 uh, avoided cost. So this is just to give you an idea which are the estimations today of cost of oxyfuel technology. And this is why the deployment of this technology is expected to be delayed. So when the uh, price of CO2 uh, will become more uh, urgent and we request more for reduction. Just to conclude, um, so up to now we have presented the mitigation level on a technology-based evaluation, looking at the least cost technology. But deployment is clear, will be a different spread and will be spread also over the years depending on a series of enabling factors. Uh, indeed, the levels are only partially under the control of the cement industry. That is the case, for example, of energy efficiency and at plants, but they will rely mainly on external enabling factors like policy, finance, and international collaboration. So the timeline that we have drawn in the roadmap reflects our expectation on enabling factors. So in the next 10 years, it will be mainly energy efficiency and fuel switching that will deliver full potential since the technology expertise is already in place and they are included in NDCs under the, the Paris Agreement. 
And there are also action plans already in place for fuel switch and energy efficiency. Clinker cement will take a little bit longer because it's necessary to stimulate on the market the demand for branded cements, particularly from green public procurement. And also, uh, as we have seen, the innovative technologies as alternative binders and carbon capture and storage need some more time because they are still at demonstration testing phase. And so they will need also huge investment uh, in the medium and long term. Uh, I will leave now the word to Martin to explain a little bit more into depth about policy, finance and international collaboration needs. Thank you, Manuela. Next slide. Uh, so the challenges are, are huge and the challenges are clear. We must put the processes and systems in place to ensure that we meet the challenges. Failure is not an option. There is an absolute need for government and industry to collaborate closely to enable this. One cannot do it without the other. There are three main areas on which collaboration must focus. Firstly, we must agree truly international and effective carbon pricing mechanisms that transcend international and regional borders and avoid a carbon leakage risks. Through, for example, developing appropriate financial stimulus packages. Secondly, we must accelerate the drive to implement innovative technology, of which the sector has many. The excellent progress that has been made by the sector in reducing CO2 intensities has been founded on the three legs of clinker, clinker substitution, use of alternative fuels, and driving energy efficiencies. And this momentum will continue, but as the roadmap clearly tells us, there remains a huge gap to meet the challenge. This gap will be bridged by implementing innovative technologies, including CCS, CCU. Working together through creating the necessary regulatory and technical environment, we need to accelerate the implementation of these technologies and turn the many good ideas that come from the sector into the reality within the necessary timelines. Specifically, we must accomplish commercial scale demonstration of oxyfuel carbon capture and gain experience of operating large-scale post-combustion capture and cement plants, as uh, Manuela outlined. Thirdly, we must work together to allow the increased usage of sustainable products, such as blended cements and alternative forms of binders, through broadening specifications and driving through strict product testing regimes. There also has to be a real focus on encouraging architects, engineers and contractors to promote optimised carbon concrete designs and construction techniques. In order to optimise these designs, a full life cycle approach must be taken in assessing the performance of buildings and infrastructure, and this must be built into building codes and regulations. And as the next slide shows, Next slide. As the next slide shows, this takes money and the huge level of investment that will be required to turn the actions into reality. To just deliver on the RTS, the reference technology scenario, between 107 and 127 billion US dollars in additional expenditure will be required. This increases considerably to between 176 and $244 billion to meet the two degree scenario outlined in the Paris Agreement. Industry alone will, un will not come up with this money and government are, are unlikely to. However, close collaboration between the two, which has been demonstrated already in such vehicles as public-private partnerships, can generate and will generate that level of money. But the focus must be on creating those vehicles and that close collaboration, and together we can uh, achieve it. So uh, that's the last slide of the formal presentation. And what I would now uh, propose is to hand over to Philippe to chair and take any questions. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Uh, 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 yeah. Do you have any go? Okay, so I'm trying to uh, find out. Apologies for that, I think. 
Apologies for that. I, I hope it will get better. I'm not sure you can understand me. Better now. So, um, uh, apologies for the technical problem. So, um, uh, I'm Philip Ponta, and I'm uh, uh, very happy to uh, welcome you to this uh, webinar this morning. I would like to thank my members uh, who have contributed to this exercise and uh, to thank IEA also for the very good collaboration we had with them. Uh, thank also ECRA for the very uh, important input they gave to this process. And uh, finally, last but not least, thank my team for their contribution to this project. Um, in, at this moment of the session, you have seen uh, what the roadmap indicates to us in terms of what needs to be done and the challenges we have ahead of us. And we would like to open the floor for a Q&A session that could last for about 15 minutes now. Um, so we would like to uh, uh, open the floor to anyone who is attending the call. Um, you have two possibilities. Either you write a question through the question session uh, in the, in the, on the slide on your computer. You should have a, a question part where you can write your question and indicate uh, what are your concerns. Or uh, on a, on a disciplined way, you can try to intervene and asking the question by indicating who you are and what type of question you have, and then we will address it to uh, our members. So um, I just would like to to open the the floor now, if possible. Who would have a question? So we, we, we have a first question that appear from Mr. Edgar Martinez, says, has been durability impacts on concrete considered from the use of new su supplementary cementitious materials? So um, I think that should be addressed to IEA who, who made the model. So uh, maybe uh, Araceli or Simone, if you want to uh, intervene, did you hear the question? Uh, thanks, Philippe. Uh, sure. I mean, we can we can uh, tackle that. I guess Manuela can also add into this. Um, so I think one of the aspects that, as Manuela has presented, that when we were looking at different alternative binding materials, um, but also other cement constituents, was to understand what the um, applicability would be to different uh, market applications. And there's quite a lot of discussion in the roadmap document that, I mean, we haven't really mentioned, but by the way, you can download and through those, these links that are displayed in the screen. Um, there's quite a lot of discussion about market applicability. Um, and uh, there are examples of those alternative binding materials, for instance, which are already uh, commercially available, as mentioned Manuela, especially the light cement that um, are, have been, I mean, are being used uh, for instance, in, in China. And uh, in that case, there are also uh, discussions related to how um, the different characteristics would impact the applications they would be more targeted uh, for. Um, and of course, one of the issues of, let's say, new blended cements that are not widely used, as also was mentioned in the presentation, is the fact that uh, some of the standards are not uh, at the moment, um, let's say, uh, covering those. And uh, testing of durability for these products is also uh, needed to be encompassing the development of those standards so that this could be, I mean, both could be go hand in hand uh, to open opportunities for market deployment. So there's quite a long discussion in the in the roadmap in that in that respect. In terms of the um, concrete angle, um, one of the points that was mentioned uh, through the presentation is that the roadmap focuses on uh, the cement manufacturing boundary and opens opportunities for further work and follow-up activities in exploring uh, where uh, gains or sustainable uh, sustainability gains would be throughout the whole construction chain in a low-carbon uh, built environment. And this is an area actually that, I mean, we are discussing 
uh, at the IEA, uh, we are uh, starting a, already an ongoing project to look at uh, construction uh, value chains in terms of, I mean, from a material efficiency perspective, and this would open opportunities also for energy and CO2 savings. So understanding how the, I mean, cement manufacturing process could uh, be coordinated with the uh, integration of cement in concrete and in different applications throughout the whole uh, construction chain uh, to make sure that cement is used in the most efficient way. And um, this is a, a project that, as I mentioned, we are working on at the moment that will be um, actually uh, released next year. And I mean, we're also having conversations with uh, colleagues on CSI about uh, future opportunities of collaboration in this, in this respect. Um, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, any other speaker would like to add something into this. No, it's fine. Are there any comments from other speakers? No, I am not. So I hope they, this answered the question. We have a second question, which comes from uh, Mr. Uh, Jesper Sand Damtoft. And sorry if I don't pronounce correctly your name. Uh, but your, your question is also very interesting and it, it touches a, a different uh, um, uh, element of, of it. So the, the, the question is, how do the EU ETS support or counteract the, the roadmap? So I would suggest that probably Mark, as you indicated, the, the financial mechanisms and the, 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 the carbon pricing and the, and the market elements, maybe Mark, you could try to address this question. Uh, what I what, well, Terry, the ETS, the, as you said, it's a European, it's within Europe, uh, and the the uh, ETS uh, basically uh, sets the, the level of uh, carbon at the uh, uh, CO2 allowances at the level of the most efficient uh, plants uh, or the top uh, performing plants, and that uh, the future strategy would be. Uh, therefore, the challenge to the sector, which the sector fully supports this challenge, is to get all the plants within Europe to that, the level of the most efficient plant. And of course, that will drive a huge reductions through CO2 usage through that. Um, so we fully endorse that policy and accept that uh, the principle, we, we endorse the principle of carbon pricing above that level. Okay, so then we have an, um, a, a technical question that I would probably address to Manuela or Mark. The question says, uh, and, and it comes from, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> from, sorry about, about that, it comes from uh, uh, Citibat Yanotai, and the question is, does the scope of the uh, roadmap include mortar as well? Um, I, I think I would say no. We are mainly focusing on, uh, as Araceli mentioned, clinker production plants and processes. So there, we didn't, also because our getting the number right data, that is our reference database for historical data, mainly reflects clinker and cement production and not mortar. It will be included in the future whenever we de decide to expand the scope of application of our roadmap. Okay, great. Um, another question that I would probably address either to Manuela or to the IEA team um, is a question from Mr. Otmar, uh, Otmar Upscher. Um, do you have an updated science-based target for the CO2 emissions per tonne of cement? So it would yeah. to explain, to be probably interesting to explain um, uh, the process of a science-based target and the process of roadmap, which is not exactly the same, but but maybe, uh, I don't know, um, Araceli or, or Manuela, if you want to, to comment on that. I'm, I'm happy to comment on that, um, if it helps. Um, so in, in, the, in this edition of the roadmap, there's a special focus on key actions to 2030. Um, as a critical window to ensure that long-term um, ambitions in the two degrees are, uh, can be met uh, compared to the previous edition. So you'll see in the uh, roadmap document, there is a section called Key Actions to 2030, actually, and there uh, we display key uh, energy and CO2 performance indicators for cement production. Um, 
comparing the base year to 2030, uh, uh, let's say, levels uh, em embedded in the two degrees uh, vision. You can also find information uh, uh, for 2050. This is also available um, in, the, in the roadmap document. Um, so these levels can be uh, explored and analyzed as a reference. Uh, what I would just uh, raise a caution about is the, the fact that, of course, these are global averages, um, which are the uh, results of uh, more detailed uh, regional analysis. Um, there's also um, evolution of these indicators by 2030 at the regional level included in the roadmap. But when it comes to uh, use some of these indicators from a science-based targets perspective, uh, one, of course, needs to take into account that every region will have a different say, starting point and context when it comes to um, not just regulation and cement and construction standards, but also uh, availability of raw materials, um, existing, uh, let's say, uh, I mean, capacity, uh, so existing stocks. Um, different uh, also, again, I mean, the standards also impacting the type of uh, cement that uh, would be required in that in that region, how this could evolve over time as well. So it's um, a bit uh, complex, uh, let's say, using global average levels uh, to set regional or uh, company uh, specific targets, uh, because of course companies would also have, um, let's say, production activities in different regions um, in under different contexts. So. Um, I think the uh, the analysis and the results of the roadmap will be quite useful uh, as a reference for such analysis. But of course, the the results have to be taken with care, and um, and yeah, they cannot be let's say uh, used directly. Um, I would say uh, as a common target for every different context. Uh, Mark here, uh, uh, Philippe, if I could just add, it was not directly related to the question, but I think it's appropriate to mention that. The roadmap is uh, clearly uh, target, uh, targeting the cement scenario, uh, but the, the the matter of uh, in concrete the recarbonation process, which uh, we we believe could uh, uh, recarbonate as much as 25% of the uh, the CO2, um, would be a factor in the in the built environment equation as well. So over the full life cycle, that recarbonation factor in concrete uh, is another factor that needs to be needs to be taken into account uh, and it's probably worth mentioning that that is not addressed directly in this roadmap because it's, it's outside the scope. Okay, thank you for that. And we, we are receiving a lot of questions, uh, which is uh, very, uh, very good for us, and we are very happy for your participation. The, the, the concern is that we will not be able to answer all the questions during the call, but what we will do is, as we have a recording of all these questions, we will make sure that we provide you with an answer uh, very rapidly to these questions. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to have a, a, a balance of the type of questions that we, ha we have received. And the next one I will take, and, and uh, apologies for the ones will not be taken uh, during the call. The, one, uh, the next one that I have comes from Pal Chana. Uh, and the, the, the question says, some of the low carbon innovations currently under development are commercially confidential. This is difficult to reconcile with global collaboration, which is essential. Is CSI giving consideration to any IP issues for joint projects? And probably, I think this should be addressed to Mark. Yeah, that's a very good question. And just to under underline clearly uh, that uh, when in, in all co in the context of all collaborative working, that uh, that is in the pre-competitive area and uh, is is in full in full. And I stress this. Uh, uh, cooperation with antitrust, uh, 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 compliance with antitrust rules, uh, and uh, indeed uh, this is uh, every meeting we have. There's an antitrust uh, uh, element to it. So uh, yeah, we there are commercially sensitive things which are outside the scope of that collaborative working. Uh, the, the target is there are many areas where we can work collaboratively on systems, on processes, on broad technologies, and that's what we're doing. Yeah, maybe I, I'm going to take the last question that we have received during this call, and then we will reply to the others uh, outline. The, the last question I will take comes from David Cooling, 
and he says we are working in the uh, alumina industry and produce large quantities of red mud and it appears that red mud can be used as a substitute for clay in calcium clay how do you engage with the cement industry to explore this further so maybe it could be for manuela or mark on that uh, about red mud definitely manuela yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I don't have a really a technical uh, answer on, on this specific topic. Um, I, I think indeed that individual companies on this very specific topic that are also linked with local availabilities of recycled materials are, are working independently on, on doing research and test the applicability of the material and the, how it will affect the performance of the product. So I think it's more and more, uh, more case by case uh, uh, research activities by, by individual companies. Um, alumina, of course, is a uh, is high relevant material and is one of the main components of uh, CSR cement. And this is being already used in some uh, industrial case uh, application for producing CSA asset. But I think this is more a case by case and regional uh, um, application of this kind of material. Okay, so thank you. Thank you all for these questions and answers. As I said, we are running out of time to answer all the questions, but we have them recorded and we will make sure that we provide a, a, an answer very rapidly. Uh, so now it's time to, to, to wrap up. Um, so you have identified through this um, um, webinar that uh, CSI has been a, a pioneer in working with these questions and setting partnerships to uh, work with these questions by creating the CSI in uh, 1999, by having the first sectoral roadmap uh, 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 already in partnership with the IEA and with ECRA in 2009, and we have done the update today. So that's very important because no one can solve the, the issue alone. And now it's time for the sector to, to expand this partnership uh, towards a, a whole life cycle approach, because we have considered what we can do for the manufacturing process, but we have to consider the, the whole life cycle approach now and not only for the cement, but throughout the whole construction value chain. Uh, and for that, we have identified uh, uh, six types uh, of uh, stakeholders that we would like to, to look at. Uh, obviously, these are additional cement companies that are not part of CSI and that we would like to uh, 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 partner with one way or another. These are also the, the trade and industry associations, which are very important and which are reflecting the, uh, the different uh, regional aspects of it. Uh, there is also the, the companies of the construction sector, the ones which are part of WBCSD already and the ones who are not part of WBCSD that we could try to, to attract and participate with us. Uh, and then we have uh, three other types of stakeholders, which are uh, basically the, the policy makers and the, and the people who are establishing standards and building codes, but also the financial community, uh, because we have identified that there is a, a, a huge need of investment as we have seen, not only for the two degree scenario, but also for uh, the, 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 the other scenario that is developed by, by IEA, the, the RTS scenario. Um, and then we have also to work with the academies and the research institutes to try and identify uh, new products and new ideas that could turn, uh, turn into um, a commercial and uh, implementation process. So for that, uh, we need obviously a lot of public private investment and a lot of cooperation on that. Uh, to support the sustainable transition of the, of the cement industry, to try and scaling up the, the implementation of the process, but also to research new opportunities and, and uh, once again, uh, transform new ideas into a higher level of what we, we call the, the, the ladder, you know, technology, um, uh, to make it more mature and then, uh, um, let's say, be, be implemented, but also to work collectively, and that is what we uh, we have on the last point, which is important to leverage the international collaboration to support the, the two degree scenario vision. Uh, it's very important to have this international collaboration because the, not a one size fits all solution exists. And there are solutions that will be uh, more practical in some parts of the world, uh, depending on the available availability of materials 
or depending on the level of development of these countries. So that's why we have also developed some regional roadmaps like we have done in India and, and in Brazil in cooperation with, uh, uh, with IEA. And it's very important to get this, uh, this regional uh, input uh, to identify how by combining the different types of solution we can have a, a global input to support these two degree scenario vision. So uh, with, with that said, uh, and uh, as Mark clearly indicated, uh, we have identified that we have a challenge, uh, that we have a, a gap to fill to meet the two degree scenario, but as he clearly said as well, uh, the failure is not an option. So we, we really need to um, uh, federate the, the sector and have this international collaboration. Uh, we are still on the way of thinking of uh, uh, exactly how we could organize uh, this uh, international collaboration. But I can already um, uh, announce you that we plan to have some events on June 5th um, this year. Uh, June 5th is the World Environmental Day, and we will uh, um, uh, move forward into uh, establishing this international collaboration and work with additional partners to um, uh, match the gap that we have identified for the roadmap, which is important because, you know, in the end, a roadmap is essential to give you the vision and which gives you what you need to do. But if you consider the roadmap as a book which is on a, on a shelf and you don't do anything, that was useless to do it. So now we have to implement it and to make sure that we can uh, close this gap and meet the two degree scenario, which is essential and which is in line with the Paris Agreement. So with that, as a, as a conclusion, I would like once again to thank all the participants of this webinar. Uh, we're going to have a second webinar this afternoon uh, with uh, uh, to match, you know, the other time zones uh, which were not uh, able to um, to be with us this morning. Um, as usual, this webinar has been recorded, so you you will be sent with a, a link to uh, listen again to this webinar. And uh, as I said, for the questions which have not been answered during the call, we will prepare rapidly some some answers and we will send them and share with the, the, the people who have asked this question. So thank you all. And uh, we are now closing this, uh, this webinar. And thanks for your participation, your questions, which are all uh, very interesting. Thank you very much. Sorry, uh, is still anyone online? Yes, we are. Yes, we are, Manuela. Okay. There are also so I think 20 minutes. Can, can we perfect. wait for two minutes for people to leave? I think we should reconnect. We should close the call, Manuela, and try to reconnect. Okay. At the same number, same connection? We will send you okay. connection with us, Manuela. Okay, thank you.